It's time to take your seat in the front row with Mike Vaccaro. Here's your host, Mike Vaccaro. Hey, thank you, Chuck, and welcome, everybody. Mike Vaccaro here in the front row. As always, behind the scenes, J.R. Quitman, our creator, producer, and director. Thanks for joining us once again. We appreciate you watching us, listening to us, subscribing to us as well. Great responses to our previous podcast. We have another great guest here today. It is Connor Barth. You may know him from the NFL, also from North Carolina. He's a kicker. He is from Wilmington, North Carolina, made his way to North Carolina, record-setting kicker with the Tar Heels, spent 10 years in the NFL, and he talks about his journey with us and maybe a journey that will continue back in the NFL. He'll tell us about that, trying to make a comeback potentially this season. A lot to get to with Connor Barth. Also talks about some of his side projects going on right now in between his kicking career. Once again, in the front row, our guest in episode number 35, it is NFL kicker Connor Barth. Connor, first of all, we, we appreciate you taking your time out of your busy schedule for to, you know, to join us here today, talk about your story. And uh, uh, you're a guy that, I guess you were born in Virginia, but eventually moved to the Wilmington, North Carolina area. What, what, what made that move for you guys? What made that move necessary for, for you, the family at the time? We actually, um, I lived in Memphis, Tennessee for six years as well. My dad was a professor, so he was getting his, um, he was getting his, uh, what was he getting his graduate degree over at Virginia Tech satellite campus and then the University of Memphis, I guess it was Memphis State at the time, um, offered him a job over there teaching political science. So we took the job there. And then in 1996, um, it was between UNC Charlotte or UNC Wilmington. And I'm glad my dad chose Wilmington just because if I didn't grow up at the beach, I don't know what, you know, not, nothing to Charlotte, no, no, you know, no offense to Charlotte, but growing, growing up by the beach was, was fantastic. And I think it kind of shaped me into the person I am today. So I have to give my dad a lot of props for taking the, uh, the UNCW job. There you go. UNCW, the first step for, for Connor Barth being uh, the, the person that you are. What, you know, what is it about the beach and the community in Wilmington? Obviously, you know, we live here as well. So, uh, you know, what is it about this community that, that you really love and you've gravitated to through the years? Um, just the kind of the slower pace of life. I just love, I've, I've lived all over the country playing, obviously. And um, I always come back to Wilmington just because it's a slow pace of life. Everyone's super nice. I mean, everyone says hi. Everyone's just uh, just fantastic and super supportive. And I just love a smaller, smaller town and sm smaller town feel and that community feel. And it's been fantastic. So I think it's helped me just in all shapes and walks of life to be able to take a deep breath and being able to go over to the ocean or jump on the boat for a little bit has just helped me kind of be the person I am. So uh, just the small town community feels awesome. Well, growing up, a uh, younger brother, Casey, as well, you guys uh, eventually would become football kickers. But what else were you playing growing up? What other sports were, were part of what you were doing? Uh, my dad always kind of preached uh, team team sports and I always joke now because I'm gotten into golf a lot. And I'm like, yeah, why didn't you get me playing golf, man? They're, you know, they're making it's, it's I could be making all this money till I'm 50, 60. But now he always jokes, but he always kept us in uh, team sports. So we played, I mean, we played everything baseball, soccer, basketball. Um, actually, my best sport was probably baseball. It was a big, big um, baseball was massive back in Tennessee. And um, that was probably my best sport. But when I moved to Wilmington, I just didn't feel that same sense of, uh, I just wasn't as much of that. I don't know. We weren't as good in baseball yet in Wilmington, I guess, from a competition standpoint. And I wouldn't have had to go to Myrtle Beach. So I stuck with soccer and then uh, and then obviously that transition into football. So Casey and I played everything. And that's just kind of what my dad taught us. Let's be be well-rounded in all different sports and then, you know, pick that one that you love. And the nice thing about my dad and my mom was they never really pushed us. They just want us to have fun. And uh, we kind of just fell into both of us fell into soccer and then that and that football transition. So. Yeah, Wilmington's a really great soccer community. When was the first time you started kicking and, and saw maybe that, that transition from soccer to, to kicker and, and saw what maybe your future could be like as well, kicking? Um, it was my freshman year of high school. I'd never never played football. Um, my dad's a Notre Dame grad, so he's a big – we'd watch football every Saturday on, on the weekends, and obviously we're, we're Bills fans as well. Um, I never just – never picked up football, but one day – I saw a game on – I saw a Notre Dame game on Saturday, and I was like, man, I wonder if I could kick a football. And my dad's like, why don't you give it a shot? So um, the actually the football team was looking for a kicker because at the time back in early 2000, it was kind of a wide receiver or like a position 
player uh, as the kicker. There wasn't really – you weren't seeing as many guys focusing just in, on kicking and punting. So we had a wide receiver at the time, and they were looking for a kicker. And I jumped over there after a soccer practice one day, and they saw me kick some field goals and kickoffs. And they were like, whoa, this you're pretty good. And uh, so I, um, I had thought about soccer. I was like, I don't know if I was good enough to play in Europe because that's where all, obviously the big money is. And so someone told me, hey, if you if you give this football thing a shot, you might be able to uh, get a free free ride to college and help your parents out and not have to pay for, for school. And I was like, that's pretty cool. So I started going to some camps after my uh, – I, I got moved up to varsity my freshman year. So I played junior varsity and then varsity for a little bit. And after that in the summer, I went to some camps and started to kind of see that I was doing pretty well with competing and finishing pretty much in first place at all the camps. And after that, I had a long talk with my dad, and he was just like, "Hey, man, if you if you like kicking, you know, I'll, I'll fully support it because he's a he's a football guy." So my my mom and dad they're football they're football fans. So I just completely got rid of soccer and uh, focused on football from my sophomore year on. And after that, it was just kind of it was just I was I put my full focus on it, and that's what you got to do. And uh, I was winning everything, every camp, and I started to kind of see that, hey, I have a shot that maybe playing college here and. It was probably after my junior year, um, I started getting ranked pretty high and started to see kind of the letters coming in from colleges. And I was like, man, I might, this is, this could be pretty cool. I could, I could save my parents a lot of money um, not having to pay for college. And it just, it just worked out. And um, it was a tough decision to figure out where I wanted to go, but everyone kept pushing me to go to my in-state school. And, uh, you know, if UNCW had a football team, I, I, I like the beach. I mean, uh, I would have probably considered it, but um yeah, I ended up staying at my in-state school, so it was uh, it was it was fun. But I, yeah, after my junior year, probably I would say is when I really started to see, hey, I I'm pretty highly ranked in my high school class for my position, so I might have a shot here to get a free ride to school. And, and you mentioned you, you played at Hoggard High School here here in Wilmington. You played for Scott Braswell, which was uh, you know a revered head coach there. The stadium's named after him. Uh, now, what was it like playing at Hoggard and playing for somebody like him? Uh, coach Braswell's fantastic. We actually had lunch on Saturday at uh, Wrightsville Beach Brewery, so I got to catch up with him. He's back in town, um, living here off and on, so it was awesome. He's just a – he was always, I thought, just ahead of the game. He always just seemed like he was just a little bit ahead of his time. And um, like I said, he found how important that kicker role is and that punting role is, and he kind of fit me in there, and he saw what a weapon I could be, and just it was fantastic. I mean, without him, I would obviously not be where I am today because he gave me that first shot. I remember – my freshman year, I was playing JV, and back in the day, we played, I guess, behind Legion Stadium against New Hanover High School. And I, he came up to me before the game. He's like, hey, man, if you kick all your kickoffs into the end zone, then I'm going to move you up to varsity. And, of course, I uh, accepted the challenge, and I kicked all my kickoffs in the end zone. And, you know, in high school, if it goes in the end zone, it's a touchback immediately. So that's like a big deal. So you're not going to get any returns. So as soon as I did that, he, he moved me up to varsity. And from there on out, I stayed up there. And uh, – I had some pretty rude awakening. Uh, it was pretty – I was only 135 pounds probably my freshman year of high school, so I got hit a few times with some kickoffs, and I was just like, wow, this is uh, this is the big leagues now here in, uh, at the varsity level. But I uh, know he's just been – he's been a super good friend of mine, and we still stay – like I said, we had lunch Saturday with him and my dad, and we're still staying in contact, and he's been a – you know, he's taught me a lot. I've, I've, I've learned so much from him as a role model, and uh, so we're still great friends to this day. So he he's a fantastic coach. As you said, he, he found the value of, of having a kicker in high school. You, you don't necessarily see that all the time. Um, so you took that top kicking prospect in the in the country, I guess, as a senior, right? So, you know, as you said, you stayed in state, but did you have offers to, to go elsewhere? You, you mentioned your dad was a, a Notre Dame fan. Yeah. Did, would, did, 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 did that ever present itself going to the Fighting Irish? I want to say it was is it Tyrone Willingham, am I correct? That was, I think he was coached at the time when I was playing and that was where I wanted to go, and he wrote me a handwritten letter and said, "Hey, Connor, you know we just, you know, obviously you're a fantastic kicker, but we already have somebody committed in this class, so we don't obviously, you know, he wrote a letter saying, hey, if it was any other year, we would have scholarship to you, but they had already signed somebody, so that was kind of a bummer. But I look back and say, hey, I kicked in Chicago for a couple of years, and Notre, you know, Notre Dame's got that similar climate, and I'm definitely glad I picked uh, you know, picked Chapel Hill, but um, I kind of." I look back and I'm, I jumped the gun a little bit. No offense to UNC, I love, I love Chapel Hill. You know that it's my, it was an amazing place. But I wish I would have taken the the official visits a little bit more serious. I mean, I had a, I had shoe boxes full of letters. I mean, Oregon, uh, Ohio State, you name it. I was, I could have probably picked the school I wanted to go to if I really, really 
uh, got into it more, but it was kind of between Ohio State and it came down to Ohio State and UNC. And uh, Mike Nugent at the time, who's a good buddy of mine, he was going to be a senior. So I would have had to redshirt behind him. And then at Chapel Hill, Coach Bunning uh, kind of said, hey, man, you can come in and be a freshman and start. So uh, it's kind of a no-brainer for me. I didn't really want a red shirt, so I wanted to get in there and start immediately as a freshman. And then UNC gave me that best opportunity. And, uh, you know, I maybe would have gotten the national championship or so at Ohio State. But like I said, I, I'm a I'm a climate guy because you got to think about that as a kicker. And uh, I think I picked the right, the right place to kick just because uh, – Played in some cold places in Ohio State, Notre Dame. Those, you know, up there in the Midwest is uh, a little rough sometimes. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, like I said, it's one of those things. And UNC would just be, became the best fit for me because my dad and my mom obviously are big on education, and we felt like, hey, if the NFL doesn't work out, you know, you got a great education from UNC, and that's always been a big thing to us is that you got to look about, you got to look at your future not on the football field, but also you know, other places. So I thought it was going to be a great fit for me. And my parents were only two hours, you know, two and a half hours away. So they, they'd be at every game bothering me and annoying me. And it was, it was great. Well, you mentioned John Bunning. He's kind of a common thread for a couple of our guests. He was a guest of ours uh, previously in episode 14. What what was it like playing for him? And unfortunately for you and for him, you had transition coaching change from him to to Butch Davis during your time there. But what was it like playing for uh, John Bunning? Coach Bunning is uh, the through and through Tar Heel, and he's you know he played there and just had just bleeds Carolina blue. And um, as soon as I met him, I was I knew it was the the right choice to go to Chapel Hill. And like Coach Braswell, Coach Bunning and I are still super close. I mean, um, he he was living up here. Obviously, he's down in uh, Naples full time now. But just an amazing guy. Taught me so much on and off the field, and kind of gave me that first opportunity and stuck with me. You know, I I had a really good freshman year. Um, obviously, everyone kind of remembers me from that that big kick against Miami, but my sophomore year, I, I struggled big time. I, I just couldn't find my, I think I kind of lost, lost track of uh, kicking for myself and I was kicking more for the fans and stuff like that. So I, uh, I didn't have the best of the, of a start for my sophomore year, but coach Bunning stuck with me and where he could easily probably put in a backup guy for a little bit to, to rattle, to rattle me a little bit, but he stuck with me and uh, yeah, I ended up working out really well. So we're still, like I said, super close to this day. And, uh, I owe him a lot, man. He just taught me so much um, as a man and everything like that. Cause that was one of his biggest things was not about football, but teaching to be a man and, and get, give me those life lessons after, after football's over. Well, you mentioned your, your freshman year, 2004, honorable mention, all ACC outstanding year, 14 of 18 field goals. And let's talk about that Miami game. You had the game winner. Miami was number fourth in the country at the time you win it 31, 28 on your kick. Take us through that because they they call a timeout. They try to ice you during that time. So you're a freshman, big stage, big opponent, big moment here. What's going through your mind? Well, the funniest, I, I was actually talking to my my running backs coach at the time, Coach Powell. I think he's up at University of Pittsburgh now, but it's the funniest story ever. But I always remember this. During the timeout, he came over to me. He's like, hey, Connor, come up here a second. I was like, all right. Uh, he goes, hey, man, just want to let you know, don't ever eat yellow snow. And I'm just like <laughs> – I had no clue. I'm like, you know, I'm in this moment. I'm 18. I don't know what's going on. I'm like, what are you? I didn't even think about what that meant. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's just trying to get my head, obviously, you know, out of the out of the moment, not to and to get a little laugh out of me. And I remember Coach Bunny came up to me and I was like, Coach, get away from me. And I don't 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 talk to me right now. So I just it was a crazy moment. Um, I kind of knew there was already I kind of saw it in my peripheral vision, like there was already people jumping kind of over the hedges and almost already on the field. And I was just like, man, I have to if I don't make this, I don't think I'm going to get out of this, uh, out of the stadium alive. So um, it was just a surreal moment. Uh, you know, I, luckily I had a, I had a, end up being a 15 year vet in the NFL as a snapper, Greg Warren. So I had him snapping to me because that's amazing. And that gives you some confidence right there. And then Jared Hall was a senior at the time and he was a great holder. So I had some, some veteran guys kind of getting that hold and snap for me perfectly. And that kind of put me at ease a little bit. And, you know, I always say like the game was tied. So it's not like the, it's not like a game winner where it's it's still a hard kick, right? But it's yeah. like if we don't make it, all right, we go into overtime. It's not the worst thing. So that was kind of what I thought. I was like, all right, if I don't make it, maybe I can make one in overtime to kind of make me a little bit less nervous. But uh, people don't remember, but I missed like a 38-yarder earlier in the game. And I don't even know if you remember that, but I always joke with my friends. It's like everyone always remembers the last kick. And like that's great because I was – People were probably like, if they really knew that I missed that one, they're probably like, man, he's probably a little nervous because he missed a short chip shot earlier in the game. And I was like, man, I just got to just have to put it. It wasn't my best kick, but 
it went through and it was a uh i still like smell like bourbon and i just still smell all the like alcohol just from everyone running on the field i think like my like head got cut open by someone's hand it was just may- the field goal posts are out of there it was mayhem and and uh, it was pretty cool that was a fun fun night i'll I, I have like college kids that come up to me now, like, "Hey, man, I was there when I was like five. I'm like, "How oh, great! <laughs> I'm old." So uh, it was cool. It's it was a great experience. And 42 yards as well. So it's not a chip shot at 42 yards, especially you know, as a freshman on that stage. I mean, that's that's quite an accomplishment to come up with that kind of you know big moment for you. After that moment, did you feel like, "Hey, I'm the big man on campus" type of thing? I mean, I've always been like, I've always been super humble. People always ask me, what would you do after the game? I was like, man, I, uh, <laughs> my parents are actually in town. I just, it was, I, honestly, we didn't get out of that because it was a night game. Uh, Chad Scott obviously was the, was the man that night, um, ran for, I think over like 200 yards, but me and him were sitting in the locker room till like 12, probably 12, 1230 at night, just after all the interviews, we were just so tired and it was Halloween weekend. So I, uh, I should have had more fun, but I think I went back to my parents' hotel and just hung out there and just ended up crashing there. Um, I just, I'm a kind of a low key guy. So wasn't a big party or what, not a big, wasn't a big party at the time and all that. So obviously I was a freshman in, in college. Um, but, uh, man, I was, I was pretty low key that night. And, uh, I've always been, my parents have always told me to, you know, stay humble and I just want to spend it with my family. And the next night I went out a little bit just to kind of walk around and just see, cause it was actually Halloween. I've heard, you know, as a freshman, yeah. You hear Halloween's amazing at Chapel Hill and it was, it did not disappoint. It was just, there was people dressed up like me with like, cause my hair was down to here when I was a freshman. And so people were like dressed up with me with my Jersey on. It was just, it was hilarious. And it was, it was pretty cool to see that and just see the support from the, from the uh, other classmates and stuff like that. So it was, it was a lot of fun, but yeah, I was, I was pretty, I look back now, I was pretty lame. I wouldn't stay in my parents' hotel room. Like that's, that's terrible, but you know, hey, it's kept me kept me focused. So that's good. So you go out on Halloween and people are dressed as you. Yeah, it was. So, so the, the, you know, the difference of maybe making and missing that field goal, right? I think the other. I don't. I don't know. I probably would have. Well, luckily, I'm blessed. But luckily, you know, you didn't have Instagram and Twitter and all that stuff back, so you didn't, couldn't get the uh, those tweets and stuff that you probably wouldn't want to get. But uh, they would have been good tweets because. You know, I actually made the kick, but yeah, there was. I was only walking down Franklin Street, and I was like, "Holy!" Like, I was like, "Well, that's that, that eerily looks kind of like me." And I'm my buddy uh, Chase Rice. Uh, a couple of my other teammates were just like, "I think people are dressed up like you." I was like, "Yeah, I don't." And no other ten, like number ten with long hair. I think that's me. So uh, it's pretty cool. It's just cool to see, like, you know, people care about care about sports there and love uh, love supporting. It was, it was a lot of fun. Well, that was a big kick. He also had a 50-yard kick, a freshman record against NC State, a big rival as well. Would you think and do you think that that's a bigger kick than the game winner against Miami? Which one in your mind is bigger? I mean, definitely. I mean, the Miami one just kind of, well, from a program standpoint, Miami definitely, and Coach Bunning would say the same thing because I don't know if you heard. I saw an interview recently that I guess Steve Spurrier was literally getting hired like the next day, but – and he said he had an interview when I guess he was recently. He said, yeah, I was about to take the job at UNC, but then this kicker guy made this. I think he said it was a 55-yarder, so that's nice of him to say that. It was only 42, but uh, he said this kicker guy made this kick, and then it didn't work out. So Coach <laughs> so Coach Bunning ended up – we always joke about that because he ended up staying there for a few more years. And uh, so that was definitely a bigger kick from a program standpoint. But uh, I have so many friends that are NC State guys, and it just kills me every day. So being able to hit the 50-yarder against NC State feels pretty good. And I always still remind the guys um, this past year was a tough, tough game. But um, yeah, the, the 50-yarder was cool as well. It it was good for me from a from a pro standpoint for scouts to see like uh, the distance I had that early on in my career. So you said great success your freshman year, sophomore year, you had some struggles there. What what was the mentality? As you said, you, you kicked more for the fans than, than you did for anything else. Uh, what, what changed there? Yeah, I just kind of lost – I think I just lost sight of just uh, – I was just not – I wasn't focused. I wasn't – I was just worried too much about the outside noise and just worried about how people would react and just, uh, you know, as a freshman, I just went out there and had fun and did my thing and – that's how I've always kicked. I've never let anything bother me, but I think I just kind of got a little bit in my head about like, gosh, if I miss this one, what's going to happen? And um, just got a little bit out of place. And 
Um, but towards the end of the season, I, I, I got locked in. And, and after that, it was pretty much, uh, you know, it was pretty much lights out the rest of my career. I mean, I didn't have, obviously, I don't think I had 11. I was 11 for 11 my junior year. We didn't kick a ton of kicks, but I, there were some longer kicks in there. Um, but, um, you know, I wish I always talked to my, I talked to my punter, David Woldridge, at the, uh, he held for me my senior year, but I always joke, I was like, man, if I would have known you could hold, you could have held for me for my sophomore all the way through my senior year. Because when he held for me, I think I was like 31 for 34. I'm like, man, you would have made things a lot easier on me. So I look back now that I'm like, I'm grown up and I obviously understand the position a little more, but, um, you know, I look back, I'm like, if I could have a little bit more uh, comfort at the holding position, a little more fluidity there, like, I think that would have helped. I, I changed holders. I think I think I had four holders in four years. So it's just if I would have known how important that was at the time, I was only 19 years old. Um, I think that that sophomore year I might have had a little better year, but I turned it around and ended up I'm doing doing just fine. Yeah, every, everyone focuses on the kicker. You're the one that's kicking it, but there's the three people, as you said, the snapper, the holder, and then the kicker. There's a lot going on in a short amount of time, right? Uh, is, is confidence in those guys a big part of being a successful kicker as well? Have a confidence that what's going to happen that leads to that kick is going to happen the right way. Yeah, I mean, that's the biggest thing. I mean, you got to trust that uh, your snapper is going to give you laces perfect and you're going to have a have your holders going to get it down. I mean, uh, luckily, um, after Greg Warren graduated my freshman year, Mike Murphy ended up snapping my last three years, which is awesome. So you got – Great fluidity there. He was a great snapper. He he gave me laces to our. He gave me laces perfect almost every time. And because um, I'd let him know if he if he didn't, because he's still obviously a great buddy of mine. But uh, yeah, I mean, just having trust in your snapper and your holder is huge because just you just know that hey, there's you know they've got everything else you got to worry about. Just knowing the ball's going to get down, it's going to be the way you want it. Because I always tell people when I you know when I go to kicking camps or teach teach kicking, like if a uh, if if the hold is off, if the holder misses the spot by gosh, I mean, not even an inch. I mean, that can translate in your plant foot being a little bit off and you pushing the ball or pulling the ball. So, I mean, everything's just got to be so spot on. And luckily, um, I don't know if you can still do it, but we would, we would able, we were able to take like a little piece of tape and kind of put it out there on the spot. So that just helped uh, help the holder have a little bit more visual of where the ball needed to be. Just because, I mean, if you're off, like, I mean, it just messes everything up, especially when you get out. I say 40 and in, you're pretty much, you shouldn't miss. Like if it's a little bit off, if the laces are bad, but outside of 40, a lot of variables change if that ball's not where it needs to be or the, or the laces are in or anything like that. So uh, it's, a, it's a kicker's nightmare when you see laces uh, staring right at you. So you just, I always let my, I'd let my snapper know like, Hey man, don't ever, don't ever do that to me. Again. <laughs> so, but I could go, you could have like a podcast on just the art of kicking like for six hours. There's just so much, so many intricacies of, uh, of the position. It's pretty, it's pretty fun. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned you played baseball growing up, and you see the difference of when that ball hits the barrel as opposed to the handle, the end of the bat, the difference that it has. So I, I can certainly see that, and and again, the importance of all three of those guys. But uh, again, great career for you. Uh, you finished up 19 consecutive field goals in your career, 54 career field goals, which was a record until your your brother broke it. Casey broke it with 55. Uh, so he comes behind you. You know the success that you had. At Carolina, did that help? Did that hurt him? What was that relationship like, you know, as you were trying to help him out following you? Man, he, uh, I always get, I always get emotional, but I'm super, I just feel like he never got enough credit for how well of a career he had. I mean, he, to come in behind somebody who kind of, I feel like, you know, set the bar at, at Chapel Hill at my position, at, at the kicking position. I mean, I, it's tough to come in behind someone and want to, uh, walk in those and, and fill those shoes, but he came right in and, and, uh, and, and plugged away and had a great career. And um, it's just funny because he had a little bit easier than me because when I came in, I didn't know anybody at Chapel Hill. So I had to meet, you know, I went into a locker room not knowing anybody. And then when Casey walked in, a lot of my buddies kind of were redshirted or might have had a medical, medical red shirt. So he knew like, he knew half the team just because, uh, you know, because of coming up to the games all the time and, and hanging out and stuff like that. So I feel like he had an easier transition in like kind of the social social aspect but I mean he had to compete I mean he didn't have the job his freshman year and then he he, he beat um a guy out Jay Wooten who ended up transferring to South Carolina having a good career and and Casey man he's a plugger he's not the he didn't have the strongest leg or not the biggest guy but man he was accurate and uh, made a lot of kicks and 
I, I mean, I'm super proud of him because, I mean, I come in and do that. I mean, he's got like every record now, I think, as a kicker pretty much. And that's just like, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's, and he's a dad now, so I'm an uncle. So it's pretty awesome to see that. Um, and uh, I, w- I was pretty cool. I, actually, my bye week um, in the NFL actually fell on a game where he actually broke my record for most field goals in a career. Yeah. So I actually got to be on the field when he did that. And that was pretty cool to be able to get out there and celebrate. And uh, I always say, you know, records are made to be broken. And, hey, if it can stay in the family. And I always say, man, you run a little better teams. He's in a little better teams <laughs> than I was. So, like, I look at him like, you know, I probably could have had more in that 70 to 80 range field goal. You know, if, if but, hey, he, uh, he took what he had. And, like I said, he wasn't the biggest or strongest guy. But, man, he, uh, he came in and had a great career. Yeah, if your records are going to be broken, why not keep it in the family and have somebody like that follow you? So that's that's great. I'm sure, you know, Barth name is all over those kicking <laughs> records at, at North Carolina. So, uh, again, you go through, you have a great career. When did you think maybe the NFL was going to be a possibility? Were, were you hearing from scouts? Did you did you know that, you know, something was going to happen here after your senior season? Yeah, I mean, uh, kind of after my junior year, you know, having going – you going 100 percent having a great year you know i had a 54 yarder in that in that in that stint and then i was i always had good range and stuff like that obviously if i look back my i mean my overall percentage wasn't the best for my four years but um i started getting you know i i had i hired an agent and he kind of just started uh getting some feelers out there and we were thinking hey maybe i would get drafted um i went to some pre-draft visits and i went to a seattle pre-draft visit i had workouts private workouts from atlanta Seattle, Baltimore, and Kansas City. And, you know, I thought we thought maybe we would get drafted in that, you know, five to seventh round area. But, you know, it's always tough as a kicker, you know, getting drafted as a kicker. I always say, yeah, I mean, you can probably find a good kicker in free agency. So that's ended up what happened, what ended up that, what ended up happening. And Kansas City um, called me and they actually signed me. So didn't get drafted, which was the dream, but I uh, got a, that was a priority free agent and got a little signing bonus, which was pretty cool out of college because, uh, you know, that's, you know, as a college kid to get a $5,000 signing bonus, I was pretty pumped. I was like, oh, I am rich, man. This is awesome. And uh, so Casey uh, gave me the call and uh, got, you know, went there. And then it was, uh, it was up and down there for a little bit, but got, I got, I settled in. So. Yeah. Your, your journey, I'm sure isn't unique for a kicker. I mean, you've been signed, you've been released, you've been signed, you've been released. I mean, it's, it, it's crazy, you know, and, you know, as a kicker, it's such a mental position as well going through your journey that you went through getting signed, getting released a number of times, there's a play on you mentally at some point. Yeah, it was tough. I mean, I, uh, I can, my dad had met my dad and I duked it out many a times. I mean, it was, uh, it was, you know, it's, you're always, it's a, you know, once you get to the NFL, it's a, it's a, it's a business now. And you're, you're not just look, you know, you have an agent who has to, he's working for you. And, uh, you know, I had to make a, at 21 or 22 years old, I had to fire somebody that's, you know, three, you know, 50, 50 years old, which is not the easiest thing to do. I didn't know how to do that. I've never done that, but it's a business and you got to look out for, you got to look out for yourself and because you're your own entity. But um, yeah, I mean, whew, my, that, that rookie year was rough. I mean, I, I thought I had the job in KC and then, you know, they, they were like, we want to go with a veteran guy. And I'm like, no, that, you know, there's nothing I can do there. So they, they went with a veteran guy and I ended up going back to, uh, Chapel Hill and working at the golf course there at Finley, just picking up, you know, driving that cart that you get hit with, with the, with the driving range, just picking up golf balls and cleaning golf carts. And uh, so I went from doing that to getting called back to KC about, you know, three fourths of the way through the season and ended up, you know, having a good, I think I went 80, I went 10 for 12 or 80% or something like that for them and ended up having a good, a good year. So it was crazy. It was just, uh, I've never really, you know, gone through something like that in my life that early on in my age at 22 years old, you're like, you know, you're on, you're at, you're at a high and then all of a sudden you're cut and then you're working at a golf course. And then, uh, um, they call you back cause that veteran guy didn't, didn't perform like they thought he would. And, uh, and, uh, it's crazy, but then you, you think you're, you think you're settled in somewhere and then they go draft a kicker and you're off, you're off to, you're a free agent again. And, um, it's just a wild ride. And, I've spent many a nights with my bags packed in a hotel room and people, I think the general population probably thinks that the NFL is a super glamorous business. And I think it is for a few, you know, for your higher, higher end guys, your higher, your bigger players, but for the majority, they're like me, who's got their bags packed living in a, you know, at a hotel, just hoping they're going to, they're going to make the final, that final roster cut. So it's, uh, 
it was pretty cool. It's, 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 it's definitely uh, an eye opener and, but it taught me a lot about resilience and it definitely has shaped me into the person I am. I'm a, I'm a little bit tougher of a person than I used to be. I don't give people as much slack and I feel bad sometimes. I'm like, that's just like, come on. It's just, it's just part of life. You gotta, you gotta go through those ups and downs and that's just, that's just part of it. Yeah. I mean, it, it can't be easy, but do you remember that, that debut 2008 back with the, the chiefs, as you mentioned, they, they signed you, they released you, then they brought you back in October. It was against the jets and you had a, a good outing against them. Yeah, I do. It was actually, uh, I think Brett Favre was the quarterback, so which was a pretty cool. And it was at the old, the old Meadowland or the old Meadowlands. So they used to open up the, they used to open up the tunnel on the one end to mess with the kicker. So it was always a crazy wind in there. But yeah, I mean, I I remember that like it was yesterday. It was pretty surreal to be out there on the field with a with a legend like that, like Brett against Brett Favre, which was pretty cool. And you know, after that, it's you know, it was just kind of felt like a job just working and going every day. And I kind of slowed down the game slowed down a little bit like college. And I started to really kind of settle in and, um, and uh, things kind of played out well after that and was able to kind of have a, have a decent career. So. Yeah. Your, your high water mark, your, your maybe the most comfortable you were was with Tampa Bay 2009, the Buccaneers signed you. And, and, you know, at that point, did you feel like, okay, you could take a breath, you could unpack those bags. You were going to be here for a while, or did you still think that, Hey, I, I got to go out and it's, you know, make or miss. I might not be here tomorrow. Well, luckily, I mean, you know, no one really knows, but I, <clears throat> I was in training camp with the, with the dolphins before that. And I actually, I think I kicked 95% in camp. It was unreal. I mean, I was lights out and I ended up keeping Dan Carpenter, but I remember uh, Bill Parcells was working there at the time and he brought me into his office and he said, Hey man, just keep working. Um, you know, we have to let you go here today, but keep working. You remind me of a kicker that's been in this league for a long time. His name's Adam Vinatieri. And I was like, oh, that gave me a, that's pretty cool. That gave me a huge boost of confidence. And uh, I guess because of my performance in, in, uh, in Miami during preseason and training camp, that got me the call to Tampa. And um, I didn't feel super comfortable in Tampa until I hit, um, I had a game against the Dolphins, obviously, who cut me, which was pretty cool. But I hit 350 yarders in one game, which I think is still, might still be tied as an NFL record. But um, that's when I really kind of was like, all right, I might have a chance to kind of stick in this league and stick with Tampa. And after I hit those three field goals over 50, I could tell the coaching staff had a little bit different demeanor with me. And they said, oh, this guy could, this guy's got some talent and could be pretty good for us for, for a long time. Yeah, that was November 15, 2009, 51, 50, and 54. So so did it mean a little bit more against a team that, like you said, you kicked well against or, or with, and then they wave you, and then you do this against them? Is that, that a little bit more motivation for you? No, I mean, it's just it's just awesome to – it's just cool to say, like, hey, you know, it, it was kind of cool that I – I feel like I proved Bill Parcells right, you know. Like he was like, hey, man, you remind me of a really good kicker, and I went out there and did well, and – uh I mean, anytime you can kick 350 yarders against anybody, it's pretty awesome. And to do it against, yeah, to do it against a team that didn't believe in you is, is even better. But uh, no, it was fantastic. And I think, gosh, I don't even know, the same year I had a game winner against, I don't know if that was the year the Saints won the Super Bowl, but I think I had a game winner that year as well down in New Orleans, last game of the season. So that kind of, that was the last game. And when I did that, I was like, all right, I got to be, I, after doing that and kicking a game winner, I was like, I got to be settled in now for, for a little while. And yes, after that, um, it, it, it turned out to be a great little run in Tampa, so it was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, December 2009, 47-yard overtime winner against the Saints. Um, so that leads me to the question, you know, turf, grass. Do you feel like you get better distance on the turf? Obviously, you don't have the outside elements when you're in a dome like you were with the, in, in the New Orleans. Um, it just depends. Um, I always talk to a lot of guys, and <clears throat> we, always, we always agree on the same thing. New Orleans, that dome is a – it's a cold, uh, it's never warm in there. It's always cold. Like, I don't know what they do. Like, I feel like the ball doesn't fly great, great down there, but I always loved, um, I always loved the grass in Tampa is a little bit. T- I always, I love field turf outside. That's like my field turf outside in a warm, warm climate is definitely my, my favorite. I love Tampa. I thought the grass was, gets a little bit torn up towards the end of the season, but there was always a little bit of wind, but man, the ball flew super well in that, in that stadium down there in Raymond James in, in Tampa. So I always loved playing out there. Um, and I kind of adapted to it super well and figured out that once you figure out the wind, it's, it's not, not a tough place to kick, but, um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an outside guy, warm weather, uh, field turf kind of guy. And some of those domes can just, it's just weird. Uh, sometimes they're cold. It doesn't really heat up until the fans get in there. And, uh, 
and there's a whole other element of the of the of our of our footballs, which yeah, <clears throat> and that's like my Tampa my Tampa guy was amazing. Like he that our equipment guy knew how to break in a football better than anybody I knew, and that that's really the advantage. Honestly, um, it doesn't really matter where you play. It's um, like I said, you get kickers get new balls. Kick, the K balls are new every game. So for fans out there. We get new balls every week out of a package. So it's not like the quarterback that gets to use the same ball all the time. We have to actually physically get 12 new balls every game that just are in a, in a, in a wrapped up package and you never know what you're going to get. But when I was in Tampa, our equipment guy, he just, he knew how to break those things in. He had a certain amount of time. He had that technique down and he made those balls made me feel so good when I was out there. Um, and when I saw that first, kick or that first the kickoff of the game I just knew I was gonna have a good game because it gives you that confidence when you know that ball is gonna fly a little bit farther you obviously had the inflate gate with the the Patriots not with the kickers balls but the quarterbacks balls but you know from a kicker you want more air do you want less air what 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 helps you out the most I don't like some everyone's different I don't like a super inflated ball I like a little bit of cushion um and that's kind of how I've always been so whenever I'm in practice I'm always kind of finding the I'm always a, you know, I'm a, when I practice, I don't know how some guys are, but I like to make myself feel good in practice and make myself look good. So I always find the oldest balls in practice. It doesn't matter. My coaches used to get mad at me like, oh, this isn't game. This isn't game ready. I'm like, it doesn't matter. Let me just go out there and feel good. So I feel good for the game on Sunday and we can go from there. So I'm definitely a, I'm definitely a little bit more on the, uh, the less pumped up side of the ball. I just think it, it depresses off my foot better. And I've always been that way. I've never liked a super pumped up ball. So um, <clears throat> sometimes whenever we got them in, when the game started, I would try to somehow just use my tee to kind of break in the corners a little bit more and try to get a little bit of that air out of there. You talk about being super pumped up. You had to be super pumped up when you were four for four in the first half against the Panthers. I had to think, you know, growing up in North Carolina where the, where the Carolina Panthers, was that your team growing up? And then you have a, a great game against them in 2011. So as I am, a, I'll pull for the Panthers since they're in the, they're in the NFC, they're in the NFC, but my parents are born and raised in Buffalo, New York, so we are diehard. You know, when you're Bills Mafia, you're Bills Mafia. Yeah. We're diehard Bills fans. Uh, this past year was just a oh, 13 seconds. Just still haunts me every day. My dad was actually watching the highlight, the replay of the game the other day when I walked into his house, and I'm like, man, you're you're sick, man. I don't know why you're watching this, but uh, yeah, we're huge. I'm a I'll pull for the Panthers since they're not in the Bills division, but uh, I am a Bills uh, I'm a Bills fan through and through. I don't ever want to play there. I don't, it's just tough place, tough conditions to kick in. Uh, so uh, Bass is there as the kicker has done a fantastic job and I give him all the credit in the world, but uh, yeah, we're uh, the Panthers got some, uh, hopefully they'll, you know, surprise some people this year. I'm, 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 you know, as being in North Carolina, I'm, I got to pull for them a little bit and I'd love to get them back on track and have a good, have a good season. But yeah, I'm, uh, it's the bills. It's gotta be the bills here this year, man. They're, it's gotta be. So and we, and we had their GM, Brandon Bean, who's a UNCW grad. He was uh, one of our guests uh, on here as well. The Bills Mafia showed out to, to watch that episode. Um, so, again, Tampa Bay, great success. You finished there a record almost 93% in, in your you know success rate kicking field goals. That's better than somebody like Steve Christie, who's you know outstanding kicker in his time with Tampa Bay as well. Still the record there. You know, Do you look back at that? Do you think about that? And – and again, how consistent you were during your time with the Buccaneers? Yeah, I mean, I just think that you, uh, man. When I was in my groove, I was just blocked. I blocked everything out. I, there was just no noise. I was just, I was in the zone, and it's hard to explain it. But I just knew every time I went out there, I was making that kick pretty much every time. And uh, um, I think it's kind of how Justin Tucker is with the Ravens. I mean, when that guy goes out, you pretty much know he's automatic, and that's kind of how I was when I was was down in Tampa. But I also had a good. I had a good supporting cast. I mean, I had a great snapper um, and Andrew Economos. And then I had a great, great holder, Michael Kanan, who I just had so much comfort there because we actually got to spend some time together and have some years of service together. And you just get super comfortable. And um, once I get comfortable somewhere, and once you, as, a, as an athlete, once you get comfortable somewhere and you feel good and you feel like you're wanted there and you're, you know, you're that you start to perform and you let, let everything else go and all the noise outside and you just go out there and do your job. And uh, I think uh, Raheem Morris and, Rich Passaccia, who was a special teams coach at the time, who's now in Green Bay, um, they just gave me that sense of confidence and that sense of peace, and I felt at home there. And I was able to really just kind of just go out there and have fun, and and end up, you know, I was kicking some 
I, mean, I think I went like a year straight without missing a field goal when when Coach Shiano was there. So it was a pretty cool cool time. And um, you know, if I didn't uh, tear the old Achilles in some basketball, I feel like I pr maybe I would have gotten that Super Bowl. Man, I would have still been there. But hey, everything happens happens for a reason. <laughs> yeah, 2012. You're 11th in the NFL in scoring. You know, during that season, and then not just tearing the Achilles, but in a charity basketball event as well. Tell us about that moment. And it had to be gut wrenching for you because I'm sure you knew something wasn't right. Yeah. I mean, I luckily I just signed my new big deal in 2012 and I actually played in the charity basketball game that year too. So thank God I didn't tear it that year because luckily I got most of my money uh, in my signing bonus and stuff in that first year in 2012. So luckily I didn't do it then, but yeah. Um, yeah, it was just, I remember the day, like it was yesterday, like it was yesterday, my trainer and I, who I still work out with every day, Hudson, we had had a nice workout in the morning. We went and had lunch. And then um, we, you know, that night was a charity game. And he was like, man, do you really need to play in that game? And I was just like, ah, it'll be fun. And, uh, and I should have probably listened to him. And obviously like the, I think I scored the first basket and then there was a, a free throw and I pushed off to go down the court. And the next thing you know, I, something just didn't feel right with my foot. And, I'd, I'd never felt anything like that before in my life, but it was just like, it was the weirdest feeling. I felt like my shoe was like tied on, like I felt like my shoe was loose, but my shoe was completely tied on my foot. It was just the, I knew something, my parents just thought it was like, an, I twisted my ankle or something. I was like, nah, this is not, I definitely didn't twist my ankle. I can't really, I have no movement. I can't pick my foot up. And, and it was hard because I really couldn't get away with it because everything was filmed and there was, you know, video crews there and stuff. So I, uh, I couldn't somehow just like get down to Tampa and then like heard it in the weight room down there. So I still got paid, but, <laughs> but, uh, but no, it was just a tough, I hate to say that, but gosh, you know, the, there's all these, you know, the clip, you know, collective bargaining agreement, yeah. all this stuff. If I could have somehow gotten to Tampa and then like did a power clean and then tore it's like, Oh, I did it on the facility. I did it at the facility. But yeah, just one of those things where you, yeah, so Jonathan Cooper, obviously great, great player. Uh, uh, guard for in the NFL for a long time. He was at the game, but he chose not to play, and he made the right uh, he made the right choice. But hey, you know it's one of those things where I've always been a person that believes in giving back, and uh, I'll never change that for a second. And I think it's important to always help out this community who's been so amazing to me. And uh, you just got to live life, man. You can't think about it too much. But uh, I was able to come back from it, and it was a tough rehab. But it definitely, it definitely, you know, it just it was tough because you realize how much of a business the NFL is. Like when I was playing, I knew it was a business, but then when you get hurt and you come off an injury like that, everyone tells you a lot of things. And then they, uh, a lot of things change after that. So it was, um, I definitely grew up a lot. I was only probably 25 or 26 at the time. So I definitely grew up a lot when that happened. I learned, wow, you really got to look out for yourself. And as much as they say, you know, they they care about you. It's about the, it's about the it's about making the money and 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 that's at the end of the day that's what it's all about and winning Super Bowls and doing what's best for the for the team and uh, when you might not agree with it every time but uh, yeah you learn really quick and I grew up very very quick after after that injury but I ended up playing a few more years so it was it was fun. Was it the plant foot or the or your kicking foot? What, what which one was it? It was actually my kicking foot and that was the biggest thing was no one had really seen a kicker tear their Achilles on their kicking foot so which I was trying to tell them that when they did the surgery and they, they put you in the cast, they actually depress your foot down. So it's almost kind of similar to kicking. So it's not like, I think if it was your plant foot, it'd be even worse, honestly, because that's taken a lot more impact. Yeah. But it was just one of those things where I just gotten a huge contract in 12, 2012 and then our punter just got a massive contract. So I think between the two of us, we were like the highest paid at our position. And then they're like, all right, well, I came off the injury and, you know, unfortunately, our GM left. Our head coach was fired. You know, shiano has gone, who who loved me. And then you got, you got Lovey Smith, who came in. And then you got a new GM who's still there, obviously, Jason Light, who we're still super close, good buddy of mine. And so it just was, it was just bad circumstance. It was just bad timing for me. And they were just like, hey, you know, both of y'all are paid pretty high. You, the punter and I. So one of y'all are going to have to go. And they won't. And obviously, he's not coming off an injury, and I was. So I actually had a great preseason. I went 100 percent was fine but uh they went with a rookie obviously they could pay a lot less money and i think they struggled a little bit here and there they haven't they haven't, i mean ryan suckup's done a great job now there but uh they struggled there for a little while finding that the, that consistency again i actually went obviously i went i went back there in 15 and and stuff like that so i actually went back and had a good year but uh just uh yeah once you get that injury once you get an injury like that and you're not like 
kicking ninety three percent, which is pretty hard to do every 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 year. But they're going to always find a way to say, "Oh, he's just not quite as good as he used to be." So, uh, but hey, it is what it is. So. Yeah, like you said, I would think that your plant foot and Achilles injury would be worse. But with it being your your kicking foot. When did you start kicking and how hesitant were you that the first couple of times coming off that injury? Um, I started kicking about six. I started kicking no steps and kind of starting to tap the ball about six months after the surgery. Um, that's why I give credit to that Cam Akers guy from the Rams. He came back and was playing in like the Super Bowl after like six months. It's just insane that he came back and is like running full full strength at that at that speed. Because um, that I just know that's a it's really a nine to twelve month rehab and uh probably six months i started kicking but i could still had like a hitch in my step and all that so it really wasn't till i tore in july and then probably april may of the following year i started to feel pretty pretty good about it and um but it wasn't really until a full year um but i was it was it was weird i still don't have feeling on the outside of my ankle so it's just from the surgery and stuff like that so it's just i knew things were a little bit different i couldn't you know i can't i don't feel quite as i'm flexible and if i didn't feel quite as normal as I, as I was before, didn't affect my kicking, but I always knew in the back of my mind, there was something a little bit different, but I was able to kind of, I just had to trust it. And, uh, Bob Anderson, who did my surgery up in Charlotte was, did a fantastic job. And, uh, I've had no issues, knock on wood. I've had no issues since I've been running, doing all kinds of crazy stuff, surfing and stuff. So everything's been good. So hopefully, hopefully it holds up for the duration. I do not want to Please never have if, – if I can tell anybody, don't tear an Achilles. It is not a fun one to uh, – it's not a fun rehab. So. Yeah, you always hear about the ACL injuries. It, seem, it seems like athletes are coming back a lot quicker from those these days, but the Achilles now is becoming that one that uh, they say, again, obviously is painful to begin with, but then the rehab, as you said, is a, a lot longer than some of these other injuries as well. It's, it's just it, – you know, and you're – was that your only really biggest injury you had playing? It's the only in the NFL, game. but growing up as well. Yeah, only I've never missed a game ever in my life in anything. That was the only injury I've ever had, so it was a pretty big one to uh, just. I've never sprained an ankle, never broken a bone, nothing. I've never missed a game in my life, and uh, I've had a little few back issues here and there kicking, but I was able to just stretch it out and get through it for the games. But yeah, that was the first. That was the first big one, and knock on wood, that's still the only one. So I'm hoping to. I try to take. I try to take pretty good care of my body, so it was, I think it's just uh, the Achilles is a fluke such a fluke thing. You just don't know. You see, you know, you see guys in all different sports that are just, they're popping them and there's just really no reason for, it just happens. That's just a crazy, crazy injury. So. Well, as you said, you came back, you, you, you play with Tampa Bay again. You were with the, what, Denver for a little bit. We're mm -hmm. released there with the Saints. You, you wrapped up your career at, at, uh, with the Bears, uh, as you said, back in Chicago there. Did you know at the time that was that was going to be it, 2017, or, or or did you still think you had an opportunity and, and still had some you know some kicks left in that leg? You talking about just when I finished up in, in yeah, the um, yeah. I mean, it was a pretty rough uh, my my two year go in Chicago was it was a tough it was a tough time for me. I just uh, I'm a very as you'll get to if, as people get to know me, I'm a very uh, I have, I'm a football guy, but I have to be able to get away from the uh, I have to be able to wait. I have to find a way to get away from the sport as well. I have to be able to find an outlet. And I just, uh, I couldn't find that outlet in Chicago. So I just, I was, uh, I just never could get comfortable there. I don't know what it was. And I think that's in any line of work. I think uh, sometimes you fit into a job and sometimes you don't. I just didn't think I ever really fit, fit well in, in Chicago. I couldn't get comfortable kicking there. And um, when I got, when I got released there, I was just mentally just drained. And uh, I actually told my dad at the beginning of that season, because they had brought in like Roberto Aguayo and a few guys that tried to compete with me. And I was mentally drained before the season even started in 17 and we haven't even played a game yet. So uh, after 17, I, uh, <clears throat> I had an opportunity to go work out for the Falcons like two weeks after I got released, but I just, I just said, no, I needed to kind of uh, reset and get some, get some time away from football. And after that, I just, I kind of felt at peace where I was and uh, just didn't feel like I needed the game anymore. And I'm, I'm a very emotional, uh, I wear kind of my emotions on my sleeve when it comes to that kind of thing. And when I'm not a hundred percent in on something, I just can't, I can't do it. And I just knew I wasn't a hundred percent in anymore with football. And I just kind of felt like my time had, had passed and I had a great time doing it, but I felt like there was something else out there for me. Um, so I'm like that in anything, relationships, anything. I, if I'm not a hundred percent in, you'll know it really quick. And I just can't, I tried to force it, but I just, uh, cause when my agent said, you're going to Chicago, I was like, 
God, there's got to be another team out there. <laughs> but I look back now and I'm like, I probably should have taken the workout from this, from the Falcons um, right after I got released from, from, uh, from Chicago. But uh, we have like this thing called a veteran. We get a veteran one time, one time a season or one season in your career, you can take your full pay if you get released. So I chose to take that from Chicago. So for the last whatever month or two, I was still getting paid and I didn't have, and I was just at home relaxing, spending time with family. And uh, so I just, and after that, I was just like, man, I don't know if I really need football anymore. And, uh, and that's just, I felt good. I felt at peace with it. And uh, I've never been, I've always been about that. I'm like, if it's time to go, I know it's my time. And, but now I'm trying to come back. So it's just crazy. I don't know what's going on. So. <laughs> You're trying to come back to the NFL? Yeah. So I haven't kicked since 2017, but then all my friends this past year were like, man, there's been some bad kickers out there. Like if you still have any juice left in your leg or feel like you can kick again, man, you should do it. And my friends, my family, my trainer, they've all been super supportive and they're like, man, go back in and just have fun and, and do it. So I've actually been training for the last six months and I'm still hitting 60 yarders pretty easy. And uh, I went to a camp out in, in San Diego, I had a good, good performance at a 58 yarder in front of some scouts and, just trying to my agents now just getting on the horn again with all the teams and got to try to get them to forget that last kick I had against, you know, against uh, Detroit. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that I'd probably be the, I'm probably the oldest veteran free agent out there. And you look at guys like uh, the guy in new England, still doing it. Uh, folks like late thirties, you got a few guys that are up in their late thirties, early forties that are still doing it. So I feel good. I mean, I've been kicked and my legs pretty fresh now that, and uh, I still got the distance. So I'm trying to get my agent to kind of get with these teams and just let them know, hey, you got a good free agent veteran guy. So if as training camps roll around this year, hopefully I can maybe get a workout and catch on with a team, playoff team, who maybe these younger guys don't quite don't quite get it done. So uh, yeah, I've been I've been kicking pretty. Actually, I'm going to be honest. I've kicked. I'm kicking better than I've probably ever kicked. Um, I changed up my form. It's like golf. I changed up some stuff that I never knew about until now, and I'm hitting the ball straighter and farther, which is pretty crazy. It might be too late, but Hey, you know what? I'm having fun. I'm having fun again, doing it. I'm not really worried as much about the, the business side of it. And it's been a nice, uh, it's been a nice change. Yeah. You are 36. So uh, again, you're not that old. And and like you said, you haven't really kicked at least in the NFL since 2017, you missed that year with the injury as well. That, that's, that's got to play well into, like you said, uh, you know, you're, you're still kind of fresh, you know, even though you might be a little bit older to, to some standards, that leg I would think would be a little bit fresher than some other guys as well. Yeah. I mean, it's been, uh, it took a little while there. I was a little frustrated in January, February, cause I started in December and I'm like, man, my leg is not, I'm like barely hitting 50. I'm like barely hitting 50 yards. Like, Whoa, this is weird. I've never had that. But then as I kept working all of a sudden in April, May, I was like, Whoa, my leg is, it's firing pretty good. And I'm out there now hitting, you know, I was out with my dad. I go to Hoggard and I'll go up to Chapel Hill every once in a while, but I'm hitting 55, 60 yarders pretty consistently now, which is, which is awesome. That's really what, what they want now. I mean, if you're, if you're consistent from 57, 58 and in, I mean, you still got a chance to play in this, in the NFL. So again, 2017, you decide to walk away, you know, trying to get back now, but in the meantime, you know, what were you thinking was next for you? Cause I know you've got your hands in a, several different ventures, but, but what were you looking at at that point? Um, you know, at the, at the time I was, when I finished up, I was just like, all right, let me just, I just wanted to get away. So I, uh, I traveled a ton. Um, I'm a big family person. So I spent a b- bunch of time with my family and, uh, and just got to see a lot of friends that I hadn't seen. But then, uh, I've always had this weird creative side to me. So I lived at the beach and, um, I picked up a drone and, um, started shooting a bunch of really cool photography and a bunch of aerial photos of the ocean and surrounding areas. Cause we have such a, you know, we live in such a beautiful place for that. And, um, I kind of, people kind of started seeing my stuff and they're like, man, you have a pretty good eye. So um, I started just shooting a ton of photography, aerial stuff. And then I got an in-water thing for my camera, started shooting my buddy surfing. And so I do some in-water photography as well. And um, like I said, I've always had this creative side. And then I flipped a few houses when I was playing in the NFL and I loved it. And then I just thought, man, this would be cool if I could actually design the houses and build out the floor plans that I like. So I met a builder in town Drew Schaefer and um, still a great, just a super good buddy of mine now. We're both about the same age. He's kind of into that modern vibe that I am as well. So we've done, we got two houses going right now. We just finished one last year and um, 
yeah, it's been exciting. So I've, I've kind of dived into this creative side that I have and interior design. And um, I just love, I love design. I love the design. I love designing houses. It's awesome just to see what you can do and just how creative you can get. And I'm pushing the envelope a little bit in Wilmington, which is we have one in landfall starting uh, this week and it's going to be super, super modern Arizona, California feel infinity pool out to the marsh. It's going to be I'm promoting the house because I'm probably going to sell it. So it's uh, but I, I just found I had this creative side. I never thought I had. And it's been super fun with the photography and then the uh, and then the the houses. And then I'm also part owner of Blue Shark Vodka. So I got into uh, I got into the vodka business as well because that spirits, spirits industry is super lucrative. And uh, um, the owner and I, Mark Bloomquist, just kind of had a bunch of mutual friends and we uh, met and just kind of hit it off. And I helped design the new fifth we have. That's another one of my creative sides. And just uh, we've just been off and running with that. So it's been, I've stayed super busy. And, and that's the mo- one thing my parents always taught us is just to, you know, never, never rely on one thing and um, to try to kind of dip your, dip your toes in a bunch of different avenues. And we did, I did that and it's been fun so far. I'm definitely, uh, I'm staying busy. So. Hey, you mentioned Blue Shark Vodka and I know it's, as you said, spirits, but it's got a, a good purpose behind it as well. Share that story and kind of the benefits that the, you know, the oceans get by that, that vodka. Yeah, we do a lot with the Atlantic Shark Institute. So we're, uh, we, we help them a ton with trying to, uh, so people don't really, the whole reason of the blue shark is, so blue sharks are one of the most docile sharks in the ocean. People obviously think of sharks as more, you know, dangerous. And the blue shark is actually one of the most serene docile sharks. And that's kind of how we got our name. Obviously it's, we're the shark that doesn't bite because they're very, very chill, chill animals. But, um, but then, yeah, we do a ton with the Atlantic Shark Institute. We tag sharks and kind of try to figure out their migratory patterns and all that. So we give some money back to to that program. So it's pretty cool. We're big into just helping out and keeping our oceans clean. We're doing a beach sweep. Um, we just got into South Carolina, so we're doing a beach sweep down in Sullivan's Island in, in, in August and all that. So we're all about the oceans and trying to help keep our, keep our waters clean and uh, taking care of our animals and all that stuff. So it's super cool, and um, it's just fun to see – the these migratory patterns of these sharks and just trying to tag the females and just seeing what's going on and it's just been a lot of fun and uh yeah so we're always trying to help and give back any way we can and it's just cool that uh we're able to do that and i got to be a part of it and it's been it's been fun so i know you and your brother have also had kicking camps in the past as well is that something you guys still do does does he kick as much as obviously you're trying to get back into it does does he still have that leg I don't, it will be fun to see. We actually have our camp. So our camp's been, obviously we haven't had it in two years because of COVID. So actually we're back on this year. It's, um, it's July 12th um, at Hoggard High School from 5.30 to 8 p.m. And I always just tell it's free to anybody, any ages. So any kids can come out, bring your, you just come out and you sign up there, sign a little waiver when you get there. And usually we have like 50, 60, 70 kids. So it's a lot of fun. And uh, so we're having it, we're having it this year. Um, now that Casey has a three month old, I don't know if he, uh, I don't know the last time he's put dusted off the cleats, but I'm going to make him. We usually try to put on a little show at the end of the camp. So it'll be fun to see if he's still got a little something in him. But uh, I hope I can kick far. I better be able to kick farther than him or we got problems. But uh, no, he hasn't. God, I bet he hasn't kicked a football in, in two or three years. He's just so busy with work. But uh, yeah, the camp's finally back on and I'm excited to uh, to get the kids back out there. And usually we get some pretty good. Uh, some pretty good guys that come out from different high schools. And I mean, we got like two year olds to to high school to college kids. So it's just a super, super fun night. And uh, everyone gets a free t shirt. We give away some like some Chapel Hill and random stuff that I have. Like, you know, I have some really cool just stuff from Tampa and all the teams I've played for. So we'll give away some swag and have a little kicking competition. So it's a good way for giving back. I hate seeing. One thing I hate is all these athletes charging money to these kids that, you know, you're already making enough, like you're already making enough money. Just go out let these kids have some fun, see if they like kicking and it's free. And that's a big deal that we've always preached that let these kids have some fun and see if they're, if they like kicking, punting, we get a, we'll get a snapper out there, get a few snappers. So it's, it's cool. It's a good time. Yeah. As you said, you love giving back to the community, which is great. I know the community appreciates that. How can people follow you? Are you on social media? How can they, maybe purchase some of your photography because I've, I've, I've seen some, but it's, it's, it's pretty darn good. I mean, again, when you have the beach and the ocean as your background to, to take some of those photos, that's outstanding, but how can people maybe get some of the uh, photography for their houses? Yeah. So I'm, I'm old school. Um, I had a website, I took it down. So uh, if you follow, I'm on Instagram. So um, either at Conti Barth or at Connor Barth photography, 
those are my two pages. And if you, and mostly if you look at any of that stuff I have on those two pages, you can, I can print pretty much anything. So I'm, I'm a little old school cause it's not my full-time job. So I, uh, I make it a little bit harder to uh, access just cause I don't have, you know, I don't have tons of time to be, you know, it's not my full-time job. So, but uh, I still print a ton of artwork for people. I'm doing a couple, couple jobs right now. And it's, it's doing some, I'm doing a big boat downtown on like an 85 foot yacht, which is pretty cool. So we're doing a big upfit there, which is fun. So I like to, I'm old school. I like to get to know the uh, the client and actually get to interact. And it's just more fun that way. And it's more, uh, I think, rewarding in the long run. So uh, if you follow me at Connor Bar Photography, um, I have my email on there. You can you can inquire and I can help have prints purchased and stuff like that. So yeah, Connor Bar Photography, Conti Bar, those are my, I don't do the, tw the Twitter thing. I don't know what happened. I had a Twitter and I was verified and all of a sudden I couldn't get on one day and then I didn't do anything wrong. And then I don't know how to get back on. It's linked to like my email from college. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know where my college email is. So uh, I'm pretty much, I'm trying to figure out the TikTok thing. I just don't, uh, I'm not quite, I'm not quite there yet, but uh, yeah, mostly just, just Instagram is where I'm, where I'm at. So if, if photography was Connor Bar photography, you can hit me up and we can uh, get you some cool stuff for your house or your, your office space, whatever. Maybe we need to get you some stuff, man. There you go. I need, I need to, to, you know, better background here. I, I got the, the battleship behind me now. As you said, it's, it's, it's not your full-time job. You're hoping to make kicking once again, your full-time job back in the NFL, hopefully. So uh, we'll certainly be following that and, and wish for the best for you. Uh, and again, we hope that uh, we see you back uh, on an NFL field at some point. What, what would that, I mean, can you, and have you imagined what it would be like to get back out there after, you know, five years or so being out of the game, trying to make your way back in. And it'd be, uh, it'd be, it'd be pretty emotional and amazing. I mean, it's, it's, I'm kind of doing this more for just, I want people to understand that if you, you know, if you, if you chase your dreams and you get after it and you, if you put your mind to something, you can do it. And uh, no matter what's, what's happened, no matter how much time you've taken off. And I just think that it's a pretty powerful thing. And uh, it'd be exciting. I mean, I know, I know my parents never wanted me to, uh, I know my parents deep down never wanted me to retire that early. So uh, for them, I think they'd be pretty emotionally, pretty exciting to get me back out there. So there's no guarantees. I mean, I just want to have fun with it. If it works out, it does. If it doesn't, I'm not, at the end of the day, it's all good. I've had a pretty cool, I've tricked, somehow I tricked the NFL into playing for 10 years, which I always joke, that's pretty sweet. So, uh, um, but yeah, I think it'd be, my parents and family friends would be like, man, this is, you need to be still playing, and that'd be pretty pumped. So it'd be exciting times. Well, it would be a great story and a great story to follow. And, uh, Connor, best of luck to you, and thank you so much for your time here today. I appreciate it. So much fun. Thank you. Well, my thanks to Connor Barth for joining us here today, sharing his story with us, the ups and downs of a kicker, the makes, the misses, and now trying to make a comeback as well. We wish him nothing but the best in that effort. Our thanks as well to John Smith for helping connect us with Connor today for that interview. And as always, we thank you for watching and for listening. Episode number 35 in the books of In the Front Row with Mike Vaccaro. Continue to subscribe. More great guests coming throughout the summer. Thanks for joining us here today. Have a great day, everybody.